This is Kenny. I work with Kenny. You were in the Peace Corps for how many years? Two years. Two years. Yeah. So I've known Kenny for about a year and I thought it'd be great to interview you and have a bit of a chat really more than anything about your experience, why you did this. Maybe motivate and inspire other people. I, I personally believe that traveling naturally helps broaden your mind, explores more co cultures, um, but also doing something good with your life makes you humble and appreciates the smaller things you have. And I feel the Peace Corps gives people that opportunity to be able to do things like that. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. And it does enable you to travel the world for free. So that is a very good thing to keep Absolutely. In mind. Okay, so let's start with, why did you join the Peace Corps? Okay, so where I was at in my life at the time, I applied for Peace Corps in the beginning of my senior year of college. I had always wanted to do something to give back to the world. Right. I felt that I also wanted to travel with my time and do both of those things together before I actually started the career. So I was in Siena College and I was getting a marketing degree. I'm going to apply for the Peace Corps because my buddy was also doing it. Okay. So we applied side by side next to each other in the library. And the application took about 30 days to complete and it's about 20 full pages. Uh, three full essays, that's why it took a long time. And you had to like gather references. I do have to say it's a lot easier now. I wanted to see a situation that would be completely unlike anything that I've ever seen before. So I applied to go to Africa. Okay. They just said pick a region and we'll try to put you there. There's no guarantees you could go somewhere else. Like I could have gone to Asia or something, but I just applied with the idea of Africa. What were you when you, went to, when you actually signed up and you went there? When I signed up, I was about 21. Okay. I got there when I was 22, and I stayed from 22 to 24. So you're, you're pretty wet behind the ears. You yeah. just left school. Right. Most people would go, 21 year old, but no life experience. Right. No, like, what, so what were you going for there? What was your skill then that you were going to push for? Like yeah, to so... So basically, I applied for a business position because okay. I thought I could help, like, help small businesses out there. Um, however, also, the Peace Corps doesn't have, it's not just about digging wells then. No, no, no. So Peace Corps, where I was, had health, agriculture, and um, teaching. Okay. Notice I didn't say business. Yeah. Because I applied and I basically said, like, yeah, I have these business skills, I've nurtured them throughout a few internships and um, school, and they basically said, they took a look at my resume, they took a look at my application, and they were like, you know, I like that business attitude that you have, let's put you as a health volunteer. And I was like, why are you putting me as a health volunteer? Like, I don't have a health background, I don't know much about health, but there were a few transferable skills that came from business, and these are transferable skills that, uh, fulfill the generalist role of a Peace Corps volunteer. I guess everyone who gets in there has to be a little bit of a generalist. So basically they said, public speaking, number one, you, you're gonna be giving presentations to the people of the home village, of the village that you're in, or the city, or the town. Um, additionally, you need project planning skills because basically they train you for a few months and then they say, oh, bye, good luck. We gave you enough training, go out and you also need to be a very, very, very good negotiator mm -hmm. and also a mediator between people. So basically you have to be, you have to be able to resolve conflict. You tested in Utah and he is uh, part of Last Day Saints at least. Yes. And um, he did his missionary thing out there, he did his out in Honduras. Cool. Yeah. Name Sean Chandoris again. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. um, how how is the Peace Corps then in comparison to a religious kind of motivation of like, hey, we want to go out and do good, but we've also got a message to help deliver. Is there is there a, like a, relig a religious affiliation to the Peace Corps, or is it just about people wanting to make the world a better place and being active on that? Well, wanting to make the world a better place. Before I get into this, though, I do have to say. There was one moment in Ghana that I specifically remember. I was walking through this city called Wana. And I mean, it's kind of 
undeniable. Like I was the only white person that I could see all around. So basically you notice when someone else is different. So I was walking down the street in the middle of the city and I just see like a white dude with a crew cut and a black, a black tie. Right. And like the white shirt, the Latter Day Saints uniform. Yeah. I'm just walking down the street and I'm like, oh, cool. Like there's a bus. Oh, there's a white guy. I'm like, there's a white guy. I'm like, I need to go talk to him. <laughs> I need to like say what's up. But they're very, I mean, they're not similar to Peace Corps because Peace Corps is a U.S. government organization. Oh, they send, it? yeah, they send trained volunteers. It's actually a government organization. Yes. It's not a charity organization. No, no, no. Okay. it's U.S. government. So, I'll be trained. It's not like a, a signed up. Or whilst we go down here, is the plane. No, no. You no. Basically, get taught the, the what you're going to be doing, how to, and you should be good to go. Well, yeah, when you leave training. Yeah. So when you get off the plane, like you don't know what's going on. It's uh, you come in with a big group of people. We actually met up in D.C. before, and the, the Peace Corps set all this up. We had an orientation in Washington, D.C., Then we all flew over together as a team-building exercise. And then we spent three months in training. So during those three months, they teach you how to be a health volunteer or an agricultural volunteer or a teacher. So you can have no prior training in health, like me, and they teach you the basics of um, like what kind of health would be necessary during that time, and they teach you the local language. Do they teach you any of the basic first aid, CPR, then as well? Are you, like, are you actually help? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. They're so like, somebody else yeah, yeah. on the other yeah, don't, don't do that. We've got you covered. Okay. Yeah, but I'm in and out, like, I know the situations malaria can come in, and I know how to prevent it. Um, I also know like a little bit of the science behind it, like how it gets into your body and how it multiplies. Um, maternal health, so we focus a lot on nutrition. I love nutrition, and I learned a lot of it there. So I also learned techniques on how to build latrines mm -hmm. and how to build water pumps. Mm -hmm. So we can't do that, but we can hire people. So you can hire them so that you know, like, hey, we need one of these here, and you can get yes, yeah. so we got the clean water. Okay, that's cool. And you can say like. Like I could look at one and be like, oh, this is crafted poorly or this needs to be improved before it's actually usable. And this again, it comes back down to your business um, education from before. You're now doing project management and yeah. these are contractors and engaged with the movement. Typically, they, for Peace Corps volunteers, they do want college graduates, mm -hmm. but I have seen 18 year olds. Yeah. Like I've seen, you gotta be smart. I mean, definitely to get in um, if you're like 18 and no college. They want if you're a college student, yeah, yeah. don't worry about it. Exactly. Like, all you have to do is graduate college. So I have what you'll pass me as a college degree in what my mother refers to as colouring in. <laughs> so, um, yeah, mine's in graphic design. So I, I'm sure I can Are help. You the lines? Yeah, yeah I, no, 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 I'm not. I like the outside the lines. It's Good. Cool. It's cool. Stay that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so obviously they trained you up, they got you there. So you must have felt reasonably confident within your training. Um, no doubt you had anxiety. You're going to be flowing what? 5,000 miles away from home? 6,000. 6,000 yeah. miles away from home. So what did your family think of all this then as well? So um, my family was, and this is pretty typical for Peace Corps volunteers, um, my family was excited. They were also very, very, very sad, scared, and worried. So basically my mom was really happy that I'm following a dream and like doing something to help the world. And at the same time, she was like, what if you die out there? Like, what if you get really sick? There were, there were times where I did almost die out there, where I was super sick. Two weeks, anything I ate or drank went through me and came out in the exact same form. Sorry, it's gross, that's but yeah. That's the truth. That's I mean, honestly, like, I've never been that sick in my life for a few... Was that when you first landed, or was it just like something no. just, just caught something swapping out? Exactly. Like, you have... The, there's not as many food safety practices. So, like, people would serve rice outside in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, but we do that here. Yeah. Have you seen the halal guys? Yeah, exactly. So you exactly. Like, like, ready for that now. You can oh, eat street meat. I can eat anything. <laughs> but, yeah, anyway, so my parents really, uh, yeah, they didn't want me to go. But when I was over there, it was kind of like they just got to accept it, and I just got to be smart and keep myself safe. Yeah. But you had the training, so you felt confident about going out there. Right. So there must have been, though, a situation where 
your confidence got completely rattled. Like, I thought I could handle this. I was like, I'm out of there. There must have been times like that. You got one of those? Absolutely. I have a lot of those. <laughs> I mean, Thursday. honestly, yeah. Literally, like, you, they train you up, and you think, like, oh, yeah, I can definitely do this. And, you know, you have, even with the training, even though you can go around and speak the local language a little bit to people, there are hundreds of situations that you can't plan for and you can't picture before. And that's where being flexible and versatile comes in. So, number one, I was assigned a counterpart over there, right? So he was a very popular guy in the town. Like, I lived in a town of, like, 600 people. My buddy is, um, my buddy was about 40, maybe 45. Uh, he spoke English fluently. He spoke Dagare, which was the local language. And he also spoke Tree, which is like the second national language in Ghana. So he was like my interpreter. Um, but he was a pretty bad alcoholic. So, I mean, no no judgment whatsoever. Like, I'm completely fine with that. Uh, but they're not the most reliable. It, yeah, so also, um, he would tell me he's going to show up for the meeting and then he would just get like blackout wasted and not show up to the meeting where I would have to speak to the town. Right. Now these people, some speak English, some don't speak English. So there were many times I'd be in front of a group of uh, maybe 50 Ghanaians trying to slowly speak English and say, hello everybody, <laughs> I will teach you about malaria today. Do you need the accent? Somehow it helps. Like really? it's a it's a joke in the Peace Corps. Like everyone everyone's like, Oh, why are you doing that stupid accent? And my response to that would be like, Oh, go try it. Like go to your village and try it. And if I were talking to you like this, they'd be like, Mr. Ken, slow down. <laughs> I cannot hear you. My main guy was like an alcoholic and he would not show up to meetings sometimes. There were a few trainings that I had to go to to learn more about like nutrition or HIV AIDS or something like that. And we were supposed to bring a town member to like help train them up for when we leave. Yeah. Like when we go, they we hope that they would carry on the trainings, but he would like not show up. I'd be like, here's money for the bus, meet me in the city. Like we gotta go at this time, please be there. He'd be like, Mr. Ken, I will be there. I will be there on time. I will bring everything. And then just like not show up at all. Take the money and say, oh, Mr. Kim, I had to take the money and help out my sister, my family member, my, mm -hmm. and that's their, um, who, 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 who use the peace court in their own village or towns for their own political gain. Yes. So like, hey, I'm going to get this done because they know locally they'll be favored upon and therefore status wise with raise and they can become local and make more money and yeah. and then that leads, to, that leads to corruption right taught us in the beginning of peace corps in Ghana, they were like Ghanaians care very much about saving face so never make someone look disrespected in public or never right. disrespect someone in public or embarrass them or confront them like even if someone took your shit, like, you can't be like, you stole my stuff, you thief. It's terrible to call someone a thief. Yeah, so, you know, even in this situation, my counterpart, Peter, uh, he wanted to use me for a little bit of status in the town. You know, he was looked at, he was already looked at as a great guy. He already had a Peace Corps volunteer before me. He used me for a little bit of political gain. He knew everyone associates Americans with money, especially in like a very poor part. So they would say, he would always ask me for money. He would always say like, oh, I know you have it. Like, why won't you give it to me? And find creative ways to try to borrow money or anything. I've seen people, I gave them a malaria net. I've actually heard about this. It didn't happen to my people in my village, but they were given a malaria net and they said, oh, can we have two so I can have one for my son, one for myself, or like one when this one breaks? And they're like, yeah, sure, no problem. So they get two nets. They take one, they use it, and then the, the kids get a hold of the net and they use it for football. You know what I mean? Like, change it into a football net? Yeah, they change it into a football net, and then they're like, you know, just playing around with it. 
when it could have saved your life. And the parents don't say shit about this. But isn't it? It's one of those ones, isn't it? It's kids. Like we, we did it with you know, my mum would spend loads of money on like my jumper or my jacket. It's great. I love that. Yeah, I like it. It's nice. And uh, it comes to lunchtime, and every kid's just dumping them down yeah. on the bloody ground <laughs> and kicking a football. It's what unfortunately is what kids do. Yeah. But you're right. The parents should be going. No, look. This was going to save your life. This is this isn't like your t-shirt or your water bottle or an empty bottle or something. It's there's a difference really between life saving. His name was actually Honorable Malik Sundal, so for the town. I right? see. Yeah, so yeah. he was the one who brought Peace Corps into my village, mm-hmm. and uh, about a year in, there was a lot of challenges going on. I wasn't getting any work done. I was just hitting the wall over and over again. I call meetings and say, like, listen, I need help from the town. Can you guys participate in these meetings and I'll, you know, give you things or whatever. I'll give you bed nets or something. Right. People would come for the bed nets or come for the gift and then just like not change any behaviors in the town. So after a while, I was at like one of my really low points. And like he came to me and he was like, listen, I, I did bring you here for a reason and I think together we can get some work done. So together we actually came up with the plan to build 17 retreats. So basically he came to me and he was like, listen, I, I know people who can build the trains. I know where to get the materials. I know um, basically how to set the whole project up, but I need you to orchestrate it from your side too, which means I had to use my, my writing skills, my grant writing skills to request money from the U.S. government and then also organize the drop-off, the planning, putting everything out. So with the help of Malik, we ended up building 17 latrines. So we picked out people in the town. I was left out of it because I didn't want to be favored, favored people I know. So he was like, we we want to pull three people from each part of the village. Yeah. There are five parts pulled enough. And then uh, we set them up. So I actually disrespected the chief by doing that though. The chief one day calls me to his big house and there was a chief in the town. Yeah. So he calls me to his compound and he says, like very, very formal, he's got his chief like, dress thing on. And he goes, Ken, you know, we bring you here to help out, but you don't even ask us what we think about doing the latrines in the town. And I was like, Yes, I understand, which was disrespectful on my part. Right. But the consensus within the, the village, and this is where my previous volunteer failed, she said, um, we'll give you part of the materials to build uh, latrines. You just have to provide 50% of the materials to do it. These people took the, the 50% of the materials built their own thing, and then just never completed it. So they were like, we don't have the rest of the money. Like, where's the rest of the money going to come from? We're, we're farmers. Like, we don't have, we have to eat. Like, we don't have extra money to do this. So I took charge and did the entire project, start to finish, for only 17 people. The chief was very angry because he said, we wanted to make them public latrines. And I said, nah which is chief in the local language, but not. Nah. Um, if I were to make public latrines, who would clean them? And it's a big issue. When you have public latrines, they are the most disgusting thing you've ever seen. Like, people miss the little hole in the ground. There is no toilet paper. Have you it's been to the bathrooms in any of our train stations yet? <laughs> I, I, I get it. That makes me feel at like home. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> yeah, you take an elevator and all the train stations going, why is it stinking here? Yeah. Yeah, I smelled things that I never want to smell again. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the chief was like, he's like, ah, oh, you're right, you're right. And I had Malik, Honorable Malik, basically break it down to the chief and say, like, look, we picked responsible families. We're sorry we couldn't help everybody, but we did, we brought 17 of the troops to the village. Like, so where were you staying? You mentioned home. Are you staying with a family or do you have your own no. residence? So I was staying, um, I like to say, my place 
had about two football fields around me, like two lengths of a football field where nobody was. So I could look around in 360 and see uh, a house way down the way, cornfields and trees going back as far as I could see because I was on the outer edge of town. Right. Right. So I lived in a cement house, which had two rooms, and then the outside had a barred-in veranda. So I like to say it's like a little cement hallway where one side is my door to get in. Yeah. Another side is a cement wall and bars, and I had a barred gate. Okay. So Peace Corps, number one, ensures that you're safe by giving you a lock and a barred gate wherever you are. So nobody could break into my house. I had bars on my windows. And sometimes it felt like prison because I didn't have anything to do. I was smoking cigarettes <laughs> in, you know, in like blue scrubs that I found somewhere at a used clothes pile, used clothes pile in the city. And I'd be staring out through barred windows. So there were points when I felt like it was definitely a uh, prison. But anyway, I would have to also get water. Right, so that is the most important thing. Um, the culture there usually permits women to carry water to your house. Like, women say it looks silly. Men say it looks silly when a man is carrying his own water. So, basically, the women would pump the water out of the ground right. into these big basins, yep. these big metal basins about this big and this deep, and the women would all would be together, you never do this alone, maybe three or four women would help hoist it onto the woman's head and the woman would walk one football field, two Jim. football fields. My counterpart's wife would walk up to five football fields sometimes, which is why I wanted to focus so much on water when I was there. But anyway, I figured out a strategy to do it because like the typical American I want to do everything myself my way or the highway you right know what I mean I didn't want to be dependent on the children or the women to help me at some points because sometimes they're busy sometimes I need water so I better figure out how to do it myself so what I would do is I would ride to the pump which was about one football field away fill up a little jerry can like a yellow jerry can probably about this big, red cap, <laughs> pump the water myself. Every time I would pump, the children would be like, ah, Nashado, why you pump? Ha! They just thought it was funny because a man was pumping his own water. Anyway, I would take the jerry can, put, balance it on my bike, and ride home. It would take me four journeys back and forth to right. fill the plastic garbage can that I would use for water. So I would have to keep all of my wow. water in the garbage can. And I had like a little cup that I would uh, pour into my industrial water filter or something because I was not drinking the water there. Nobody drinks the water there. Who's a Peace Corps volunteer? They give you like a big filter. If I didn't have that thing, I would have been a lot sicker yeah. than I was. Um, because there's no natural immunity in me, in the people, there is a lot of natural Absolutely, immunity because yeah, they've been there for thousands of years. But anyway, um, I would also have to fill, fill up a bucket every morning and take a cold, ice cold shower. Um, met my wife out there. You met your wife out there? Yeah. That's pretty so, cool. Where's your wife now? She's in China. <laughs> <laughs> so the marriage is going great. <laughs> no, but uh, she's in China for school. But I actually ended up meeting her completely by chance out there. So she was in the main health office for a toe infection, random ass toe infection, excuse my language, sorry, but random toe infection. And I was there for like my mid-year checkup. So literally we were there for a window of a few days and I was reading a certain book. I had just finished a certain book. Do you remember the book? Yeah, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Okay. So, very, very, like, great book. Life-changing, actually. Made me want to leave the Peace Corps. Well, another one of her books made me want to join the Peace Corps. Anyway, uh, my wife was reading a book by Ayn Rand. And I was like, 
whoa, hold on. Who are you and why are you reading that book? We're just like sitting at the health office. That's how you introduced yourself. Yeah, I that was, was like, like shot I've never <laughs> been. <laughs> why are you reading that you? book? <laughs> why, Aaron? What are you doing? What do you think about the world? No, but I was just, we were just like talking about it and uh, we noticed we had like pretty similar perspectives. And um, basically, it was St. Patrick's Day and or the next day was St. Patrick's Day. And she's like, oh, do you want to come out for trivia? So she like, me to come to trivia. And I was like, ah, oh, nah, like, peace for my volunteer, bro, can I have any money? And she's like, oh, don't worry about it. Like, I'll pay for you. You can just pay me back. So what was and she doing out of that? She was there as a teacher. Okay. So she had a different job completely. She taught in the Ghana school system as a science and math teacher, and she made her own library and stuff. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Um, How far she, away was she working from your village, though? She was... 13 hours away so that's a trek i would have to <laughs> i would have to take an overnight bus to the main city which took around nine or ten hours and go two extra hours to her site but we made a commitment like after we said like hey we're gonna make this work like let's actually try to date we made a promise to each other that said we'll see each other once a month no matter what if you have to come to me, I have to come to you. We have to make up some fake reason that we have to be at a workshop together. So we like applied to workshops together. And so, like, <laughs> yeah, like, we happen to be at the same place, so we uh -huh. made it work. And obviously, I mean, I'm happy about that. Like we did go out of 